So chalk grassland is a threatened habitat wherever it's found really. And the reason for that is that it actually it's quite an artificial habitat. So it owes its existence for most of its range almost everywhere because of grazing by sheep and cattle managed by people. And that would have been the, the normal natural way to farm uh, many years ago. But in recent decades, particularly since the Second World War really, it's become uneconomic to manage grass in that way. Um, now the default way is to fertilise the grass to get it to grow very quickly and as soon as you do that you lose a lot of or almost all of the chalk grass and plants. Um, another problem is if you leave chalk grass and alone and you stop grazing it for whatever reason which has happened over a lot of the chalk grass and it naturally builds up fertility. It comes out of the rain, there's a lot of nitrogen in our, in our rainfall through mostly through pollution um, and that builds up in the soil and then you start to get the competitive plants coming in taking over so unless the, the land is actively grazed um, and material is constantly taken off um, the fertility naturally builds up and you, and you, you lose uh, the wildflowers um, so really since the 1940s, 1950s we've seen a dramatic drop off of chalk grass and, and it's only really where it's, um, it's intervention through conservation efforts it's only really there that you see chalk grass and thriving today. And what do we need to do to manage it? Well, or to look after it? Well, we need to maintain the traditional form of management that created it in the first place, which is extensive grazing by sheep and cattle. Um, and only particular breeds of cattle and sheep too, because modern breeds have been bred to fatten up very quickly and to produce a lot of meat very quickly. Um, but they will not thrive on this very low nutrient sward. So um, it's only traditional breeds of sheep and cattle that are actually some of them quite rare now um, that grow much slower, that, that fatten up much more slowly, that will, will live and thrive on, on grass under this type. So that's one way we also artificially cut it thanks to a whole gang of volunteers that come up and cut scrub, burn it and stop it from taking over. So it's a constant battle really to stop it from turning to woodland which is what it would do naturally. So um, here we are looking at a bit of chalk grass and um, directly in front of me is this is some dogwood um, which is a natural plant that will just naturally come into chalk grass and if it's not grazed hard enough. Here we actually want some scrub to grow because it's very good for attracting the Duke of Burgundy butterfly but we don't want it taking over so we have to keep grazing it or cutting it artificially to make sure that it doesn't turn into just a huge amount of scrub and then we lose this sort of thing which is the cowslip which is what we've planted this is actually been planted by volunteers to attract the Duke of Burgundy that's the, the food plant the food plant of the Duke of Burgundy butterfly and we've also here we've got an ant's nest just forming here if you see big heaps big mounds of grass on the downland that's almost certainly been created by a species of ant called the yellow meadow ant which makes these mounds. This is a new one just forming and uh, that's the meadow ant that lives with um, Adonis blue butterfly, has this symbiotic relationship with Adonis blue. And growing on the top here is this little diminutive milkwort, chalk milkwort, which is this sort of mauvey blue. This is actually common milkwort, not the chalk milkwort. at Stelling Coombe on the Stelling Downland Scheme and we're now in mid-June and this is a prime time to look at our chalk grass. So um, if you look down here you can see what I was talking about earlier, this amazing mixture of plants that have uh, all grown together in, in a compact way. It's very short turf, that's the first thing to notice. There is a bit of rabbit grazing but the main reason it's so short is because there's so little nutrients in the soil. And that's actually what we're looking for because then the big bully plants as I call them, the um, docks and the thistles and, and nettles and things like that aren't able to grow. But what you can get growing is this amazing mix of what are called stress tolerator plants which means they put up with a lot of hassle, um, and they grow very slowly and uh, they grow in harmony together. I don't know if you can make this out but just here there is wild thyme which is very, very similar to the stuff you might put on your, your food. Um, and that's growing very close to the turf, about an inch above the surface of the soil, and it just weaves its way through 
all this is wild thyme here, all these little sort of pinkish blobs. This is all wild thyme just weaving its way through the turf. Here you've got something called Salad Burnet, which is another long-lived perennial. So most of these plants are long-lived perennials. They just grow very slowly creeping through the soil. Um, and it's got these very distinctive leaves, um, which are actually, that's one leaf made up of lots of little round leaflets. Just thought I'd point out here is a bit of our problem plant. This is a tall grass, very characteristic um, light yellow tough hoary uh, leaves um, and if the fertility was high this sort of thing would shoot away you, we get big clumps of it there's a bit more of it here all mixed in but because the fertility is so low it's it's just sitting there um, mixed in with the other plants um, so what else have we got here um, here is some wild marjoram um, which again can grow much bigger than this actually so this is really held back by the soil fertility again. You can see how close, how dry and how chalky the soil is here. There's only a few inches of topsoil and then you'll be straight into pure chalk up here. And that's why the soil fertility is so low. This here is um, what's called black medic. It's quite closely related to this plant, which is bird's foot trefoil. They're both legumes. But as you can see, bird's foot trefoil's got fairly big buttery yellow flowers, whereas this black medic's got much smaller little pom-pom flowers that are um, kind of a lemony yellow colour. They're all growing together in this amazing mix of chalk grass and plants. Here we have squinancy wort, which is a very long name for a very small plant. It's got very fine, almost um, needle-like leaves, and on the end is this little sort of fluffy tufts of yellow, uh, sorry, white flowers that are just kind of sitting there. So Scrinancy wort again, it's, it will just weave its way through the turf and it's very, very easily missed, but it was just sticking its head up there. So that was quite easy to find. If you've been to the Pyrenees, you may have seen gentians in flower. There's quite a few different species over there. Here, we're not quite so well um, covered by gentians, but we do have a few species. Most of them are very rare. This one is by far the commonest. It's called autumn gentian. So we're a bit early here in June to see this in flower, but there's quite a few. There's one here, one there, one there, one there, little sort of clump of autumn gentian. And later on in the year, probably August time, they'll be up here with, with distinctive bluey flowers. So um, that's nice to see too. A bit of a bad boy in the, uh, in the botanical world. It's called ragwort, common ragwort, this one. It's growing very small here. It can grow much bigger than this, up, up to there, four, even four foot high. Um, and the reason it's disliked so much is because it poisons um, horses. But that is a bit overblown because any, any cattle horses or any grazing animal will naturally avoid this. It, mustn't, it must taste rather unpleasant. Um, it's only when it's cut in hay and dried and cut in hay and mixed in with hay that they will eat it almost by mistake. So um, it's a lovely wildflower. It's native, it's a native plant and it's used by a whole variety of insects for um, its pollen and its nectar. So um, in most places it's absolutely fine. It's only if you're cutting a field for hay really that you need to watch out for ragwort. So we're sitting here on the edge of a, an Vernant hill, which again is one of the commonest features found on really old chalk grass, but it's this big hump here. And very characteristically, that's associated with wild thyme. They, it tends to grow right on the top of these humps looks to me as though something's been digging away at this one, perhaps a, uh, a green woodpecker. They absolutely love ants. Um, but anyway, what's left of it is colonised by this wonderful big clump of wild thyme. And it does tend to grow on the top of these um, ant hills. So uh, maybe it's just a bit dry, a little bit warmer. It's really a Mediterranean plant that's just hanging on here in the southeast of England. So nice to see. So um, there's lots of different species of thistle uh, in the UK, but this is definitely one to avoid if you want to go and have a picnic on some chalk grassland. It's called dwarf thistle, and as its name suggests, it grows almost flat to the ground, so easily missed, and uh, it's extremely spiky. It, it's not actually in flower, it flowers a little bit later in the year, sort of July time, but there it is. That's a really nice characteristic plant of chalk grassland. Doesn't really grow in any other habitat, at least in southeast of England. And right next to it, or just by the side of it, hiding away in the thyme, we have 
some milkwort. Um, there's several species of this too, and I'm not expert enough to tell you, but it's probably just common milkwort. It's got this beautiful sky blue flowers you can see here, with the little white tufts on the end. And there are several different types. Some of them are very rare, but this is probably common, common milkwort. So whereas most of these plants are long-lived perennials and will grow very slowly over many years, this little thing here, which is called yellowwort, is an annual. Um, and it will just pop up in one year, set a lot of seed and then scatter it. So it's very much dependent on grazing to open up little patches of bare soil in the turf so that this thing can seed, otherwise it will disappear very quickly. So it's really nice to see. It's only budding at the moment, but it'll open up into really strong butter yellow flowers in another few days almost. It's just about ready to go. So here we've, we've walked down the slope a little bit where the soil's a bit thicker and the first thing you notice is how much taller the sward is and how much um, more scrub and tall grasses are coming in. But that's not to say that these interesting chalk grass and plants can't survive here because they can and you get different ones. So here we've got three taller plants that like this slightly taller turf. This is valerian, common valerian, not to be confused with the red valerian you get growing on roadsides and cliff edges and things. Wonderful pollinate, uh, uh, plant for um, nectar and pollen for, for insects. Right next to it we've got a pyramidal orchid, um, which is vaguely pyramidal. If you use your imagination, the flower head is small, slightly pyramidal anyway. Strong pink colour. And then right next to that we have plowman spikenard which is a sort of yellowy daisy type thing that has these very distinctive stiff rigid stems. Again, all three of these plants pretty well confined to chalk grass and at least in southeast England. <laughs>